part of this is because weaning is a multi-stressor event. And so because we have this combination of an abrupt dietary change alongside that social stressor of the change in, in housing and group dynamics and all of that, we have a few pressures that affect what we see in those young pigs. So certainly feed intake tends to drop right off. And that leaves the intestinal lumen relatively, well, we'll, we'll call it starved. And so because there's not a lot of nutrition available in the lumen, that can be really challenging for the intestine itself. Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Dr. Natalie Dether, an assistant professor specializing in gut microbiome at Dalhousie University. So Natalie, before we get started, would you mind giving the audience a brief introduction about yourself? You bet. Thanks, Clayton. Uh, so as you mentioned, I'm a gut microbiome focused professor here at Dalhousie on our um, agricultural campus in Truro, Nova Scotia. My background is a little bit diverse. I started in physiology and then made a transition to working with the microbiome during my PhD. And what I'm really interested in, I think, is a function of that background is what microbes do. So not just who's there and how that changes, but how those functions change and how those affect how diet and interacts with microbes to change host health. Gotcha. Yeah. So I've, I read a little bit about as well that all the, the work that you have done studying the gut microbiome and specifically in pigs, how it changes post weaning. And that's kind of what I wanted to um, at least start our conversation with today. So what changes exactly occur around the, around weaning in the pig's gut? There is a lot to talk about in that um, sort of first seven days in particular. And part of this is because weaning is a multi-stressor event. And so because we have this combination of an abrupt dietary change alongside that social stressor of the change in, in housing and group dynamics and all of that, we have a few pressures that affect what we see in those young pigs. So certainly feed intake tends to drop right off and that leaves the intestinal lumen relatively, well, we'll, we'll, we'll call it starved. And so because there's not a lot of nutrition available in the lumen, that can be really challenging for the intestine itself. And the reason for that is intestinal epithelial cells are highly metabolically active. And a lot of what they use to fuel themselves comes straight out of the lumen, what we call first pass metabolism. So we have that pressure from poor feed intake alone. Then we have the social stress, which actually can directly impair gut barrier function through what, um, cortotropin or sorry, corticotropin releasing factor and serotonin signaling. So this affects um, a sort of a key axis for regulating cortisol in the brain. And all of that can cause uh, increased um, permeability of the gut and a decreased ability of the gut to keep the microbes in the lumen and keep from undergoing these massive inflammatory changes. So we have those two things at the same time as we have a microbiome that's adapted to a milk-based diet that has to transition to a plant-based diet. And those are not the same microbes always, and they are not the same enzymes. So just like we think about the pig's own enzymes for breaking down uh, components of the diet, we also have to think about what microbial enzymes are there and whether they're able to um, access the nutrition they need to continue to be supportive and not problematic. So those are kind of the three big ones that I think we're trying to think about in, in how we support those pigs in those first seven days. I know that there's, that's, I mean, being such an important part of swine production, um, since that can affect the pig long term, it's also very targeted in terms of nutritional remedies that people try to sell or provide that can help the pig be more um, adept for better growth later in life at that time. And there's a lot of those types of additives out there, a lot of probiotics, organic acids, and there's a lot to choose from, from a producer's um, standpoint. So from what you've seen, how do producers kind of make sense of all these and try to, when trying to decide what's best for them or when one is best for them when choosing an additive that's um, right for their pigs? This is a challenging space. And I, um, I don't envy producers having to make a decision in this space right now, to be quite honest. I think... To answer your question, I'm going to start like a little bit further back and then kind of come out what I think is the best way or what I would look at if I was trying to make a decision. 
So I think because the gut microbiota has received so much attention in recent years, because of all the things you just mentioned about how it's important for supporting health and growth and efficiency, we have a lot of information about who's there, like which microbes are there that change, but we have less information about how they function. And so that can be really difficult when you're trying to pick an additive to offset for example, um, the growth and proliferation of E. coli in a post wean pig. We'll use that as sort of our example. Um, because some of these additives, we don't actually know how they work. And we don't know if they target the microbe we're interested in or the function we're interested in. So if we're trying to support um, better adaptation to a plant-based microbiome, or sorry, a plant-based diet, um, if we're trying to support that better adaptation, then what we need is the right things in place to actually support the microbes to do that. So there is some evidence for um, certain additives now that support very specific functions. And so if I was trying to make a decision around what additive to use, I would look for additives that we know how they work. So there's a proposed mechanism of action and we know uh, what microbes or what functions they target. So there's certain um, like medium chain fatty acids, for example, uh, there's, it's suggested that they might be good at controlling E. coli populations because of what they do to gut function. So they produce um, or support the production of bile acids, which might then reduce E. coli. So that might be a great additive to consider trying if that's what you're interested in controlling. Whereas there's some evidence that things like um, fiber degrading enzymes might have a bit of a prebiotic effect by helping microbes digest fiber in those early post wean days. So looking for additives where you know what the function is, and then in a perfect world, matching that function with what you think is going on uh, in your own production system that you want to support. I do think we have a lot of work in that space to get to on the research and nutrition side to match interventions with needs. Um, and I really do think that's probably the next place we need to go as researchers to try and better support production. At Barnes, we're more than just another feed additive company. We are driven by science, innovation, and an understanding of the challenges you face in the ever-changing world of animal agriculture. We are your trusted partner for new-to-market natural alternative to choline chloride, choline plus FC, as well as enzymes, prebiotics, probiotics, macro minerals. To learn more about our product offering, visit barnes-ne.com forward slash animal nutrition. Together, there's always a better solution. Gotcha. Yeah, that kind of actually brings us to the next question that I was going to ask is, what kind of um, other information or technologies do we as producers need uh, going forward to kind of to better utilize and choose which additives um, would be most beneficial for us? I think focusing on how the microbiome actually functions is our critical next step to getting to a point where additives are really working for us um, in a reliable and robust way. And the reason for that is because of what I mentioned about the increase in microbiome studies and because sequencing from a scientific perspective has gotten much more affordable, we can generate a lot of data, but turning that data into usable information requires that that's taking it a little bit past where some studies in the past have done. So there's some traits of the microbiome that are really important to how we think about microbiome level interventions that often get overlooked. So one is that um, microbes are functionally redundant. So just because you see a change in which microbial species or genus is there doesn't mean you have a change in important functions like pathogen um, inhibition or fiber degradation or um, helping maintain barrier function through signaling because there are many microbial species that can do that or microbial genera that can do that within the gut in similar ways. So we have to think about function, not individual microbes that are there. The other piece is priority and niche effects. So part of what I love about working with weaning is the microbiome is highly disrupted, so there's a chance to make a change. One of the places that I think maybe we could do a little better when we talk about additives in production is if you're talking about um, older pigs where their microbiome is now sort of settled and all the host adapted niche occupying microbes are there, 
something like a probiotic might not make a lot of change unless the microbiome is disrupted. So I think there's a lot we can do to develop better interventions by focusing on things that we can do that are targeted and short duration, because that has huge implications for cost of production and cost of the intervention. And really strengthening our science to focus on function and validation. So let's figure out how it works and then let's go validate it in a production environment or a disease challenge. So we can do things like a dirty barn challenge or a specific pathogen and actually test whether our intervention works for what the producers need. Gotcha. Well, that's all the time we have. So thank you, Natalie, for coming on the show and sharing all your ex expertise with us. Thanks so much for having me. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't thank my wonderful collaborators at the University of Alberta, um, particularly those in the Willing Lab where I did my PhD, as well as my wonderful collaborators here at Dalhousie. Absolutely. And to everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week.